The following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of CATV2, Oshkosh Community Access Television, the City of Oshkosh, the Oshkosh Cable Television Advisory Commission, or Time Warner Cable. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Ion Oshkosh. I'm Cheryl Hens along with my guest co-host Dan Rylance and he is a guest co-host um, as he has been for a lot of these political interviews because one of our guests this evening, uh, Tony Palmieri, is running for a political office and uh, taking a little bit of a respite from interviewing political candidates. Um, but we are very pleased to be joined by two of the six candidates uh, seeking a position on the Oshkosh Common Council tonight, incumbent Brian Bain to my left, and uh, then of course Tony Palmieri, as I just mentioned. Um, there are three seats up for grabs this time around one held by Brian, one held by Meredith the Shireman. Uh, she is also seeking re-election and will appear on a later show. And the other seat uh, is being vacated by Shirley Maddox, who is not seeking re-election. Uh, later in this half hour, we'll be joined by two other candidates, Jess King and Mark Nielsen. But for now, um, we're very pleased to have you both here. So thank you very thank you, much. Peter. And uh, congratulations on uh, getting through the primary. Thank you. Uh, Brian, I, it was not really a surprise, you know, that you did as well as you did. Um, I'm sure you weren't too shocked, were well, you? I, I, was, I think I was shocked coming in first, uh, mm -hmm. but I, I was hoping that I would at least make it through the primary. Um, but yeah, I'm very excited about that. and It's mm -hmm. very humbling. Sure. And Tony, I mean, this is your first time seeking local office as far mm -hmm. as city politics goes. You've run for state assembly a couple times in the past, but and you came in second. You, you beat out incumbent Meredith Shireman by something like 100 votes, I think, didn't you? Yeah, about that. Yeah. And I was happy for about two seconds, and then I thought, <laughs> I thought it means I have to work much harder because these are six talented candidates. Many of them are going to spend, I think, fairly huge sums of money for mm -hmm. a local government race. I'm spending less than $1,000. So my race is a few literature pieces, yard signs, and a lot of word of mouth and door-to-door -door campaigning. So it meant to me I need to really get out there and meet more people. Mm -hmm. Sure, and there's four weeks as we tape this mm -hmm. before the election. What, what are your plans, Brian? Oh, uh, we're going to do exactly what we did two years ago when I came in sixth in the primary uh, and, and worked just as hard. We'll be out knocking on doors and talking to constituents and, and uh, putting up yard signs and doing lit drops, the same things that we did two years ago. Okay, all right. Well, we're going to be asking some questions of each of you, and um, you know, some will be directed just to one or the sure. other, uh, most of them to both. And you know, feel free, as we talked about before we started actually taping, to interject with each other if you want. Just sure. don't. Spill any blood on the tablecloth. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the, the one thing, um, you know, there's an architectural study being done right now of the uh, convention center to decide what kinds of improvements are needed to update it or, you know, to decide if we need a new one uh, altogether. Um, city manager Dick Wallink has said the city could spend up to a million dollars on the upgrades and that that money could come from an existing TIF. Um, so, it, you know, at the same time, there's also talk of raising the hotel motel room tax mm -hmm. to, I believe, 10 percent. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, I, so I guess the f one of the first questions is, you know, do you believe that we have a need for an upgraded or a brand new facility? And with that, how do you feel about increasing the, the hotel motel room tax? I do think we need some sort of new convention center or updated convention center space. Um, we're, we're sorely lacking in that. I, I think in hotel space in general, in that whole market, we're, uh, we're sorely behind our competitors. And with tourism dollars, with the river, and with the, with the other events that we have here in the community, I think that uh, we don't have something that we're being able to capitalize on. So. Um, I think it's good that uh, the, the study is being paid for uh, by private money so that we can kind of get some ideas. I think they're going to put forward a um, kind of good, best, better uh, scenarios and then we're going to be able to talk about those things and find out what we can do. 
with regards to the two percent increase to the hotel um, I, I, I you know right now I do support that I think it's something that we can uh, capitalize on the tourism dollars that we have coming in to help pay off that debt and retire that debt sooner and also put away some additional money for a development fund to actually do more things to bring in some extra tourism dollars okay. I just want to follow up on something you said um, you know, why, why do people feel that we need more rooms in this community I mean when there's one big <coughs> choice right now for out along the uh, al along the frontage road um, kind of in the area of where Golden Corral is sure. down mm -hmm. uh, I guess to the north a little bit from there and when that was first talked about in the newspaper they were saying that the occupancy rates are like anywhere from 50 to 70 percent sure mm -hmm. so I'm not sure why we need more hotel and motel rooms. Well, if you, if you talk to anyone at the Convention and <coughs> Visitors Bureau and you talk to the people who are actually trying to book the events, um, they will tell you that we're not able to land the bigger, larger conferences that bring in those dollars and bring mm -hmm. in that revenue and uh, opportunity for Oshkosh because we don't have enough space for them. Hmm. Um, and so, uh, you know, we have to go with the, what the experts are saying in that area. And obviously, um, the, the hotel owners and the, uh, the developers of those areas the, the person who's looking at building that new one also owns another one here in the community. Mm -hmm. So obviously, um, you know, the, he, I don't think he would be putting himself mm -hmm. in comp competition with himself on another hotel if he didn't feel that there was a need. Okay. Tony? I do want to see our city manager take a lead role in advocating what we need to do with the convention center. I think there seems to be a consensus developing that something needs to be done, renovation or, or, or something. I am a little bit concerned about that 10% tax, the, the increase in the hotel motel tax, because that would make Oshkosh the highest motel mm -hmm. hotel room tax in the state. Now, I understand there are good reasons for, for doing it. I would like the council to look at the possibility of exempting from that tax uh, local people, citizens, and also local businesses that bring in people to interview and so on and end up reimbursing for the cost. Uh, Motels and hotels in a city like Oshkosh make their big money during EAA, Country USA, and big ticket events, but the majority of the year is slow time, mm -hmm. and it is the local people and local businesses that get you through that slow time. So I think it would be a good thing, at least for the council, to look into the possibility of exempting the locals from that tax increase. It may be that state law doesn't allow for that kind of exemption, but if it does, I think we should do it. Okay. I, my response to that is that would be a headache to manage. <clears throat> I don't know how you would write a statute or an ordinance. How do you define local? How are they going to identify as local? And who's going to determine whether they're doing it right or not? If, if I was running a hotel, I think I'd, I'd, I'd take two aspirins every day. <laughs> and, <laughs> well, I mean, and they might be already. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> seriously, I mean, it, it's really micromanaging. Yeah. Uh, and how, do you, how, would you, how would it work? Well, I think on the, we can't say on the one hand we're looking for ways to be good to taxpayers in the community, yeah. and on the other hand, the moment we come up with suggestions to do it, we just simply debunk them out of hand. Mm -hmm. I think there are all kinds of ways uh, with modern accounting technology to easily separate out-of-town visitors from people that are local. You can do it by address. You can do it by, by the business that's, that's paying the reimbursement for the room. Th it can be done very simply okay. if the government entity wants to do it. Yeah. I, I just think it's, I don't think it's a good precedent to dismiss things out of hand before we even look into them. And I, I you know, I, I think we certainly could look into it. I, I think who we'd have to talk to are the hotel managers. Yeah. Th that, that would be the question, you know, what kind of accounting systems do you have right. and what type of an expense would this add to your business if we were to do something like right. that? Right. Um, the other thing with the, with the tax too, just to make sure, is that we're really only looking at about $2 additional to what someone would be paying uh, if they do stay here because the, the room rate that we have, the rack room right. rate, is one of the lowest in the in the valley and if not in the state. So, you know, we by adding it, yes, we are adding, but it really would only be about uh, $2 extra uh, per night for a person to stay. I know, but that sounds like a variation on it's only a butter burger basket. Yeah. I mean, these <laughs> no, for, it's for not me, a, no, it's me, not a comparison. It's, 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 sta it's just stating yeah. that we are, we, we right. do have the lowest room rate in the, in the community. But for me, it's less about the two dollars, or less about the ten dollar a month in the in the former garbage fee, and it's just more about the principal. It seems like the locals are always being asked for more, without our local government first showing what its role is and first creating the problem, and then secondly showing that it's looking for other alternatives. So it's, to me, to me, it's just about principal mm -hmm. and showing people that you're looking for ways to keep all costs reasonable. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
I want to play devil's advocate with both of you. We've kind of warmed up a little bit with sure. the thing. So, Brian, I want to pull some issues out of your first term. Okay. And see whether they're a fair or not, and then give you a chance to respond and Tony sure. response. So the five that struck me as significant, you voted for the Otter Fishing Club Pier, both at Miller's Bay, at Miller's Bay, both as a member of the Park Board and the Common Council. And to my recollections, you said nothing at the time about either one. You supported what do you, the... What do you mean when I said nothing well, about them? Any objections to okay, it okay. as a board, as a park member or as a councilman? You just they just went through. No, I did ask questions at the parks board meeting. Did you? Yeah, it was unfortunately it was an untelevised parks board meeting. Okay. It was the one that we visited. We were actually at Rainbow Park. Okay. Uh, it was right after I got elected. First parks board meeting that I attended, and I did ask the question: Was this part of the plan? Is this something that's been planned yeah. out there? And the answer that I was given, we talked about this when Chuck Williams and I were yeah. actually were on the show, is that yes, it was part of a plan. Now I since learned after the fact right. that it necessarily wasn't. But you didn't vote against it at the party. Th but th no, because no. at the time I was told it was a part of a plan. Okay, okay. All right. You supported the garbage fee, true or not? I, I did so I did vote okay. for it in May, okay. yes, but I did not support it overall. Um, I did vote for the fee initially, or uh, inevitably I had to vote for the fee at that point in May, yeah. um, but I was uh, one of only two people who tried to remove it from the budget process to begin with. But you voted for the city budget that included the garbage fee. I did. Yeah, so you voted for the garbage fee. No, because at that time we didn't implement the fee. Okay. You violated the open meetings law in attending a closed session of the council regarding the fibers, but you did apologize. Is that, would that be it? Um, uh, well, we have an attorney, assistant attorney general who okay. gave an opinion that said that in the same breath, he could also see where we could argue that it wasn't okay. illegal. So, and I'm, I'm not going to say what we need to do, and I said yeah. that at the meeting, we're not here to say whether it was or wasn't because that's okay. for a court and no okay. court has done that. No okay. court has done that. Okay. What I did say though is we need to make sure that we're being as open and accountable okay. and honest as possible. And if we did do something wrong, we have to make sure we don't do that again. And I yeah. questioned City Attorney Kraft right. at that time and said, what are we going to do differently in our, in our publications, in our process so that we don't make sure we get ourselves in even this situation okay. to begin with. Okay. You voted against the proposed increase in the mill levy uh, passed by the council, which was placed in the ballot. I think the vote was 4-3, but you were one of the three people that voted no. Is that the correct? referendum question the to referendum raise it? Yeah, question. I did vote yeah. against that, yes. Yeah. And lastly, you really sacked the library on the budget. You spared police and fire, but five people at the library lost their jobs. They, they did, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so those are kind of the five th highlights that I picked. And you've kind of, uh, Tony, your response to any of those, pick out one or two that you agree or disagree with. No, I, I, some of Brian's opponents have said that he flip-flops on these issues, and uh -huh. I don't think Brian flip-flops. Uh -huh. I would call it a kind of backtracking. I mean, what, what I've seen Brian do is that when something like Miller's Bay comes up, and he comes to the realization that it was done in 24 hours, that was improper, he backtracks and tries to correct it. He saw that he you know, had a role in the garbage fee being created, saw that people were outraged and try and get it off the books. Uh -huh. So I mean, I think, you know, backtracking is better than flip-flopping, but the better thing is to get it right the first time. Okay. And that's what I want to do on the, the Common Council, okay. get it right the first time. So can you guarantee so you'll get everything right, no, Tony? No, <laughs> I mean, because no. I think that's a little presumptuous no. to say. No, no one can, no one can guarantee anything, but I, okay. ca I, I can guarantee that when it comes to open government issues, mm -hmm. I will not go into uh, a secret meeting where it's clear, clear that the city council is greatly stretching the statutes. Mm -hmm. And the council had more than enough citizens, and Dan, you were one of them, mm -hmm. the Five Rivers Five, right. that told the council that night, do not go into this meeting. There was no reason to have that meeting that night. We could have easily had Warren Kraft contact the AG's office and reschedule that meeting. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe Brian can explain what was the hurry to get in the meeting that night. Well, uh, the reality was we were told by our attorney that it wasn't, okay? So we, I was listening to our city attorney. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what you do in a legal process. You listen to your counsel, mm -hmm. and based on what we were looking at, after the fact, <coughs> clearly there was a city assistant uh, attorney general who said, they could see where it was and they could see where it wasn't. Mm -hmm. So there's a gray area there. So I think what we need to do is say, okay, when we, w if we ever come to the, one of these forks in the road again, mm -hmm. what can we do to make sure that there's not the gray area? That's not backtracking, that's just saying, look, there's obviously a question of, of what happened, what can we do to make sure that there's not that question again the next time? Mm -hmm. 
That's, mm -hmm. that's I think, what you need mm -hmm. to do. That's leadership in, ta in terms of taking something that happened and building upon that and moving forward. Well, I think leadership on the night of that closed meeting would have been to listen to not just one citizen, but several citizens, and including the Oshkosh Northwestern, that before that meeting had deep, deep concerns of, about it. There, if I'm on the council and there's that much reliable public input telling me wait, I'm going to wait on that. Mm -hmm. I thought all the citizens that asked the council to wait had credible argument, had done their homework, were not asking the council to do anything unreasonable. They were just saying hold off on this. And it just seemed to me, with all due respect, that the council put the needs of the developer, Tom Doig, ahead of every other issue. And I think that that's unfortunate. That's how it looked to me as an, as an outsider. And it's actually one of the reasons why I'm running this year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so, so Brian, if, if you had to do it again today or tomorrow or at the next council meeting um, and, and something like this came up, would you do it the same? Because obviously City Attorney Warren Kraft says he would advise you guys. This well, time. what I'm going to what I'm going to make sure we do if we ever have a closed meeting on a topic like this again is to ask a lot more questions prior to the meeting mm -hmm. about okay why is it I understand that the what, what we're citing under the current code of why mm -hmm. we're going in but what is it that we're talking about that we can't talk about in the public sector and how does that fit into the statute that's the question that needs to be asked and that's what I would do the next time so if I felt comfortable with that then yes I mean because there are appropriate times when you in when you are in negotiations mm -hmm. with someone where obviously like when we're sure. doing our union contracts we can't have those sure. those strategy meetings out in the public because mm -hmm. then we're revealing everything that we're willing to do sure. so you know you have to ask those questions ahead of time and make sure that you're actually meeting the spirit and the letter of what that's saying okay. and that's what I'll do differently but that's what I would you know if, if I felt comfortable then then obviously yes sure. I would go forward with that okay. we have to we have to be able to trust our staff in that and if we're being let down by our staff then we have a major issue and we have to address that okay one of the things going on right now is um, the, the council is going to be asked to put a curfew on the water fest uh, festivities and, and having them end at I believe 10 o'clock just like the city ordinance you know noise ordinance uh, is set up for um, you know at, at the League of Women Voters Forum I, I believe that neither one of you was quite ready yet to put mm -hmm. a curfew on that right. um, what um, you know what what would make the case for both of you as far as <coughs> ending those festivities earlier? Well, I want to see more of the neighbors make an organized effort. This is one person that basically... Yeah, that, I mean, that's all, that's all I'm hearing yeah, so far. Yeah, I mean... I, and, I, and, and I have great respect for that one sure, person, sure. but I think it would be irresponsible for a council to vote for something on the basis of that limited input. Mm -hmm. So I want to see the neighbors make more of an effort mm -hmm. to make that case. I did say at the... At the Forum that in our community, especially in older parts of town, mm -hmm. many of the citizens simply don't know how to get a petition going, how to organize themselves, who to call in City Hall. Mm -hmm. And I do think, and I, I'll give Brian credit with his five, uh, Fifth Tuesday forums, yeah. he's allowed the opening for people to do that. Mm -hmm. And we need more of that kind of thing. So that way people can make the case. Now, I'm not saying that I would then necessarily vote for it. But I think it's part of our responsibility to help people make their case to the public so that it can be heard. Mm -hmm. Sure, and I think that's what we, that's why we did the proper thing by laying it over to give people yeah. the opportunity to talk to us. And I have, you know, I've had citizens contact me on both sides saying, no, don't do it, yes, mm -hmm. do it. Um, and then obviously uh, we have to look at that issue come actually Tuesday, next Tuesday. So. Okay. Um, now, merchants downtown are wanting to see the downtown action plan put into action and, uh, you know, really restore some life and vibrancy down there. Um, making it a destination point is, is what uh, one or two of them said. Um, you know, that's something that some of us have been saying for years now. Um, what do each of you feel about the current plan? And what do we need to do to get things moving in a more positive direction down there? Something that is going to be, um, you know, something satisfactory to the merchants. Sure. I think it's time to bring the plan back out and revisit it in public. Um, you know, when you think about what was 2000 or 2001, I think is when that was uh, 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 put together and agreed upon. A lot has changed, and we have actually had a, a, a change in our demographics and you know, new people in the community who may be f willing to support something like a downtown action plan, but they're not quite sure exactly what's involved. Look at the council. The council has changed quite a bit over mm -hmm. the past few years. Right. So I think it's time to bring it back out, open it up, talk about what's in it, talk about what progress we've made, what steps are in place to accomplish some of the other goals, and then are there new things or are there different things that we need to do in the plan to actually adapt 
mapped it to where we are in 2007. Okay. Colin? One of the problems with our at-large system of government is that the downtown, if you think of it as a district, does not have one member of the council who's charged for dealing for that area, I I I if you will. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, there seems to always be a lack of continuity in advocating for that area. I do think if, if the downtown action plan is going to happen, I don't want to sound like a broken record here, but neighbors in a community have to get organized and they have to keep the issue at the top of the city's agenda. Mm -hmm. Because as at-large representatives, we're handling the entire city and it's very difficult to get four votes for downtown in that system. So neighbors, uh, what, what, I, what I'd like to see is just what the LDR consultants called for. They said you need some organization that is charged specifically with advocating for this action plan. And we've never created that to my knowledge. And I would like to see a coalition of downtown business owners, people from the university, uh, members of city staff, average citizens as a kind of coalition to work for that plan. Because without that kind of public advocacy, nothing is going to happen down there. Okay. Go ahead, Dan. I picked on Brian a little bit. I want to pick on Tony a little bit. Tony, I've known you since <laughs> I came to Oshkosh. And you're an activist <coughs> by definition, sort of a critic. <coughs> Yeah not, yeah, not sort of one. I, you I, are. Yeah. <laughs> and in reviewing some of the things, and I may not have some and some wrong, you've been more against things than you've been for things. Mm -hmm. uh, widening of Jackson Street, 100 block project, Walmart. You've never said a good thing about EAA that I can think of. Uh, Five Rivers, obviously, you're opposed to. And then I was trying to figure out if Tony Palmieri has ever supported any TIF district that's ever been proposed in the city of Oshkosh. And I came up with none. Hmm. Uh, so. With that track record, and I may have some wrong here, so correct me if I'm wrong, but my point is that you approach things with anger and negativism more than positive. So if you get on the council, are we going to see Tony still the activist on the council, or are we going to see m a, a new Tony or a more positive Tony? No, what, what you'll see in each one of those cases, my concern is whether the city's municipal codes, whether the state statutes are being upheld. In the case of EAA, my only concern with EAA has been their attendance figures. Right, but you're beating just, that just, pretty just be, on, just be honest. <laughs> well, when organizations exaggerate their economic impact, okay. it doesn't help anybody in, yeah. in, a, in a city. Uh, but they do bring great things here, and I think everybody acknowledges uh, that. My role as a counselor is to make sure that our municipal codes are being upheld, okay. that our city manager, who is the full-time professional, is doing his job, and that any developments that are coming to the city are being done properly, not behind closed doors okay. in smokescreen okay. uh, rooms. The taxpayers of this city, they want to see optimistic, upbeat people on that council, okay. but they also want to see people that know what they're doing okay. and that are making sure every T is crossed and every I is dotted. Okay. And that's what I will stand for. Okay. I'm not getting on the council, Dan, to look for a fight, okay. but I'm not going to back away from one. Yeah. If this city tries to ram a development down the taxpayers' throats, like a condo resort that no, there was never any public support yeah. that I could see for that Five Rivers resort. Yeah, I'll get involved in a tussle over that. Yeah. Not looking for it, but I'm not going to back away from it either. Okay. Brian, you want to take a shot back on any of those? You want to stay out of it in terms of things? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, no, I, I, huh? I, I think Tony agreed. Everything you said was pretty yeah, accurate. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. Okay, well, I, I just, you know, is there any TIF district that you've ever supported since you've been in town? My only concern with our use of TIF here is that we don't seem to follow the state statutes on TIF, okay. which say that the only time you create a TIF is when a development would not take place without it. Okay. I've been following politics here for 18 years. Okay. As far as I know, the way we test that is to ask the developer, okay. will you do this development without a TIF? And of course, the developer always says, no. no. <laughs> so what I want to see is a more rigorous standard for the TIF. Okay. And I also want to add something else on, on, on TIF. Not only should it be, it won't happen, and development won't happen without it, but we also need to give TIF for projects that have public support. Mm -hmm. If you don't have those two criterion, you're simply going to create a lot of cynicism and negativity mm -hmm. in your population, and that's, and that's not good. I'll happily support TIF for projects that have public support and in which the state statute criteria are being met. That's okay. responsible in my judgment. Okay. Okay. You're both employed by the university, and one of the things that I have heard, and, and I think it's a valid concern, is 
we've also got a third person on the council mm -hmm. currently who, who is uh, Burke Tower, and he's employed by the university as well. So, Tony, if you were to be elected and you're reelected, that leaves us, at least for one more year minimum, with three out of seven members mm -hmm. being employed by the university. If there is an issue that would come up that is directly involved or even indirectly involved in some way with the university, you guys would all have to abstain from that. And those essentially count as nay votes, mm -hmm. you know, in essence. Mm -hmm. So that means that everyone else on the council has to vote for it in order for it to pass. Do you see a, a problem with that at all, with three of the seven being employed by the university? Well, I think let's ask Brian. How ma in your two years on the council, how many times have you had to abstain because of a, of a university conflict? Half a dozen or so. Yeah, mm -hmm. not not a, tr a tremendous amount. The four votes would be a quorum. Mm -hmm. So, as you suggest, business can uh, can be done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, I I don't see that as an an issue, Cheryl. I think those types of issues are so minor. And I also think that every person in this community has a right to run for an office, regardless of mm -hmm. where they of uh, mm -hmm. where they work. And so I don't see that as a as an issue. Okay. No, and yeah. ultimately, I mean, the voters will decide whether or not it's an mm -hmm. issue. Yeah. I, I, mm -hmm. I don't think anyone doesn't know, if, you know, Tony or me, th to know that we do work at the university. Exactly. So mm -hmm. uh, I think that would be in their forefront of their mind if they were majorly concerned. Okay. Let's talk about um, the leach and PMI for a minute. Uh, last sure. year's revenues numbers have have recently been reported on. Seems they're continuing to lose money uh, despite an increase in gross sales. Um, so what that basically translates to is um, just a mere $30,000 in a lease payment to the city. And that's, of course, the bare minimum of what they're required to pay us. Do either of you or both of you or neither of you think that they overstated uh, what they were capable of doing when PMI came before the council? And, you know, is it time to maybe start looking at... Uh, renewing that uh, not renewing that contract mm -hmm. with them and looking yeah. elsewhere I, th I think this was something that the council was deciding when I ran two years ago because mm -hmm. uh, I remember talking about that and I I said at that time that I would not have gone with PMI I would have chosen the other mm -hmm. uh, organization and I think in hindsight that still is the better decision mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure that they overstated I, I just kind of feel like in some respects that the leech is not a premier venue for mm -hmm. PMI I just kind of feel like it's kind of the the step child over here and and when summer rolls around it, it gets promoted a couple of times and that's about it and I get email I, I signed up for their email list and I'm constantly getting things for events that are going on two three four months from now in other venues but yet no, you don't see yeah. a lot of stuff happening at the leech so I don't know if it's just that they're not interested as as much as they thought they might be and if they, that's the case <coughs> then I, I wish that they would come forward and say that because I'd be happy to entertain an opportunity to sit down with them in earnest and talk about whether or not we should continue on with the full length of the contract and then open that back up and, and see what we can do. Can the council bring them back? Oh absolutely. I mean I think I think we can have we have an option the city has an option in, the, in, in there. I don't know what specifics are in there we obviously <coughs> uh, need to look look okay. at that but yeah. Uh, the main thing they overstated was that they'd be a community partner yeah. and a friend of the community. Community groups all over town have had major problems with PMI. It's definitely time to relook at that mm -hmm. contract. And at this point, I'm leaning toward not renewing their contract mm -hmm. when it comes up. Okay. Yeah, I, w I would vote no if it were a vote today. Okay. All right. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Wow, <laughs> wow that went fast. <laughs> yeah. it, it did. We've both got so many questions right. yet, and uh, this is our last opportunity to interview you guys. But mm -hmm. thank you both very yeah. much for being well, here. Yeah. And thank, thank you. And good luck. Um, we're going to take a short like break. When we come back, we will uh, exactly. be joined by Jess King and Mark Nielsen. We'll be right back. I couldn't practice my religion. I was put to work in uh, forced labor camps. If I stay in Cambodia, I would have been dead by now. If you think differently, then you're an enemy. If you know how to read and write, you're dead. You speak your mind, you're dead. The only way to express what I wanted to do was to get out. I got to the country when I was about 14 years old. I was 20. I was 24. I came here with nothing. No money, no English. America stood for freedom, it stands for freedom. And that's why all my generation, young generation, wanted to be there. For the first time, I felt like I have a right to be on this earth. Here, you can do whatever you want to do. I love my life here. I feel at home. I'm free to do what I want. Freedom to me means my life.
How you doing? Hi. Hi. Have a nice day. You too. Thanks. If only child abuse were this easy to recognize. If you even suspect abuse, call 1-800-4-A-CHILD. All calls are anonymous and confidential. Trust your instincts. Poor nutrition today will increase Sarah's chances of anemia. Add to her health care costs, sick days, even stunt her ability to learn. And the thing is, Sarah's not even born yet. Get proper nutrition before it's too late. Call or visit WIC. WIC provides nutrition information, health care referrals, even food. Your child has you, and you have WIC. All right, welcome back to the second half of Ayan Oshkosh, and uh, we're very pleased to be joined now by Jess King and Mark Nielsen, uh, two more uh, candidates for the Oshkosh Common Council, and the general election, I will remind you, is coming up on the... Uh, 3rd of April, uh, you can uh, vote uh, at the, <laughs> well, obviously you can vote at the polls. <laughs> you can register at the polls uh, the day of the election or uh, prior to uh, April 3rd down at City Hall and you can call the city clerk's office for more information uh, as far as how to register or even to find out where you need to vote. Um, so congratulations to both of you on thank winning you. the primary and thanks for being here. It seems like you were just here not all that long yeah. ago. I think we were. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is, um, you know, uh, this is going to be kind of a little bit different for you because we're going to give you uh, some questions and, and you can uh, interact with each other, too. Um, so you can have a little mini debate, if you wish, yeah. as long as you don't draw blood okay. and uh, dirty up our, our tablecloth here. Um, but, um, it, you know, I guess one of the first things is an architectural study is currently being done of the uh, convention center to decide what improvements, if any, are needed. Um, or if we need a brand new convention center. And at, at the same time, there is talk of raising the hotel motel room tax by 2% to bump that up to 10%. Uh, a portion of that, uh, as I understand it, would be used to pay for upgrades or a new convention center. How do each of you feel about uh, the current convention center? And uh, as the second part of that question, then what about the increase in the motel ro hotel room tax? All right, I'll, I'll jump in. All right, uh, my, my first thought about it is I, I support it. Uh, in the, the way it was presented in the workshop had to do with retiring debt. And I believe that the, when you weigh the balances between the, what's the impact of the 2% raise per room rate, because it would be then 10% of the gross sales price of the room, you know, what does that really amount to? The reality is the hotel stock in Oshkosh, there's only 48 suites. So when you look at the accommodations we have, you know the, the rooms aren't exactly pricey to begin with so you say what are we really adding here we're adding a dollar to a room and I was convinced with the evidence that they provided as far as how our rates compare to the rest of the Fox Valley I think it's a good thing I think we need to retire the debt because I don't really I'm not really comfortable and you know when the study comes out we'll see what it says but we need to make sure that we have a plan to get rid of the old debt before we start taking mm -hmm. on new debt and I think it's a and it's great that the state legislature provided the opportunity and I think that's one thing that as council members as a community we really need to start looking for the, the window the door the opportunity and if the state government's going to give us one we should take it. Okay. So. Mark what about you? I agree with the two percent increase um, it will help reduce uh, that overall debt that we have and we have had for a very long time over mm -hmm. our heads you really can't move forward until that's taken care of um, which is unfortunate. Um, we, as a community, created that, um, uh, let's use a, a nice word, but uh, just a, a tough situation for us by having that. Um, the convention center itself, um, if you want to call it a convention center, it's more of an exhibit hall uh, with the concrete right. floor. Um, it hasn't been utilized, it's been underutilized. Um, if we really want to get people downtown, we really want to fill the restaurants, we want to fill the bars, um, bring other retail business down there, individuals from other communities into uh, this community, we need to upgrade that. Now, do we stick good money and chase after bad money? Um, by using that additional 2% is going to allow us to lower that and address it. I mean, I would like to see what 
Green Bay has with their KI Center, which is it's, it's carpeting, they're repainted it. Uh, let's put in, um, uh, have uh, wireless so that if there are business meetings in there, they're able to communicate and have something where they're able to utilize that. And Jesse, you, you said a good point where there's only 48 you know, suites. Those are the individuals that are going to bring money in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, last night, um, one thing that the, uh, one of the other candidates said was let's uh, not have the tax on the, the local companies. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that are bringing businesses here. Um, if, they're, if we're sending, and he used Oscar's truck, if we send, if Oscar's truck is going to another community, they're paying the tax there. So why would we exempt them from here? Mm -hmm. There is a company that uh, is, a, is a 5013C that does get exempt and uses a lot of rooms uh, and doesn't have to pay that tax. Mm. So that is money that is being, basically it's being taken away from our taxpayers that could help lower the, and reduce that debt. So it is presently a white elephant and let's change it and make it usable so that it's a benefit and a plus to everything else we're trying to do on the waterfront. Okay. And what about using uh, up to a million dollars from existing TIF <coughs> money uh, for that same purpose? I, want me to go first? Go I ahead. You're, you're, you're on, you have something to say. <laughs> let's, let, you know, let's put all options on the table. Um, you know, I'd like to look at the that fully without just saying, yeah, let's go ahead and use a yeah. million dollars. I think I mean, we I need think to readdress it. I'm not on the on the committee right now, or the council. Um, I will say it, it sounds good, but what are all the ramifications? What you know, what's the positive and negatives? Mm -hmm. So well, I and I think I think we ahead. have to decide what market we're looking for mm -hmm. because that convention center has only so many square feet involved there and you say we're looking for boutique conventions that have a limited number of members and then you think well what are those kind of smaller scale convention attendees what really are their needs mm -hmm. you know maybe they don't need satellite I mean you know you think about the kind of equipment that that we really need to do our market research mm -hmm. before we start investing and I think it's important to recognize the size and then what's going on with the uh, Riverside Park the second phase there and you know will there be parking there you know what are the other complaints that users have that facility okay. um, well and, and out of that is let's do the research to find out what we want to do to the facility before we say that uh, let's stick a million dollars right. in there mm -hmm. so let's do that and then also once you're doing that well if our hotel rooms are down below we're actually then sending those people to communities next to us right. to stay mm -hmm. there instead of here. We need to have the hotels catch up. You know, you're playing that cat and mouse trying mm -hmm. to catch up. So I think it let's not necessarily take years, but let's take our time, put everything in place, and then take the action. Okay. <coughs> Having gone through the primary, 11.1% <coughs> turnout, 4,700 of 42,000. Uh, eligible voters cost the city over ten thousand dollars all to eliminate one candidate it, you know would have made any difference to you if the law would have been different to have one more candidate run and not have two elections well I guess the 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 positive of it obviously that's an expense the positive yeah. is that it gave us a lot of time to really get our messages okay. out there and you really know what the candidates think so yeah. on that point I mean, for me as a candidate, do do I like the the endless battle? I don't know. Yeah. You know, do I do? You know, is too much not enough? Okay. Um, I personally think, though, that it was good for all of us to get the head start and get the word out and have the extra debates, so that way constituents can really feel like I understand these candidates. I okay. see the differences and. So whenever you have, I mean, it's great that we had seven candidates, okay. but two years ago we had 14, and yeah. maybe it made a little more sense when you had 14 versus seven. Right. So okay. that yeah. I see the rub. Yeah. How about you? Guidelines are set up, and just as you just said, last time there was 14. Right. This time there were seven. Right. To change it each time, uh, it's, you know, what then are the parameters going to be when, yeah. when you're going to run? Well, or does it allow someone just out of the blue just step yeah, forward. Yeah, the state would have to change it, and what mm -hmm. I'm saying is you could have three candidates for each seat open rather than two. That's what the state law is. Yep. That's all. Oh. Yeah, but I mean, well, you know, difference. All right, now you guys, I went through the selection survey a little bit here. Jess, you ran fourth with 1,842 votes in fourth place, and Mark, you ran six with 1,322 votes. How are you guys going to catch up between now and what, What's the strategy here to, to move forward? You, you've, you've, you guys are behind 
Uh, we're not looking at a high turnout election probably on April 3rd, but hopefully a lot of people will vote. So what, what's, what's the rabbit in the hat? What are you guys going to pull out that's, that's going to move you guys up to 1, 2, or 3 on April 3rd? Well, I, uh, for my, my strategy is just to continue to get the word out and continue mm -hmm. to meet, meet people mm -hmm. and continue to let people know about my platform. Okay. And um, there'll be the rest of the weekends in March, hopefully I'll be knocking on your doorstep okay. and <laughs> getting out there. And then the other reality is how many ways can you get your message out there? And I think the only reason why I came in, I mean, when I look at the three candidates ahead of me, I say, well, there's one person who has, you know, he's in the media, he has his own TV yeah, show, yeah. he's, you know, he's, he's run in two other political races before, and then the other two were two incumbents. Mm -hmm. And mind you, you know, there are obviously people that are happy with what they do and people who are not happy. Mm -hmm. So what I need to do is get my message out there about how I'm an alternative okay. and you know what my qualifications are. And I think that's that's it. Time time is on my side. Mm -hmm. How about you, Mark? When you state that we're behind, mm -hmm. I disagree with you. Okay. Because the slate was cleaned. Okay. A new now, game. It's a brand new okay. game. Well, that's, that's optimistic. That's good. Yeah. And yeah. The demographics of those that turn up for a primary compared to those that turn out for a general uh -huh. election is much different. Yeah. Those that turn out for primary are specific single issues, also certain types of a candidate or a, of a voter that turns out. The, the attention that's given in the primary and the amount of attention by a voter given in a general election is much higher. Okay. So, yes, in an 11% turnout, and I knew it was going to be smaller. Sure. Uh, I would have hoped for a little bit more, but um, 11%. Um, I did what I needed to do in order to get into those, that, sure. those six. Now, for when I say it's a brand new game, it's because even though I had so many votes and the next person had so many, we don't carry those over to right. the general yeah, election, yeah. so they're gone. Yeah. I understand, you understand, yeah, but for the yeah. people at home, yeah, just yeah, so yeah, that, yeah. It, that... I can tell gone. you from being a poll watcher for eight years in town, a high percentage of that 11.1 .1 will vote on April Oh, 3rd. I agree. Yeah, I mean, the, oh. they, they are the regular voters. But the question is, yeah. from the 11.1, .1, right. that's where the separation is. Right. And for the six of us, and if and let's use an easy number. Yeah. Let's say we go to 20%. Yeah. That, 20, that now 9%, that's what you're fighting for. Yeah. That's what you're trying yeah. to, to bring towards you. And I yeah. think what's interesting, I looked at those statistics too yeah. after they voted because I want to see, well, is there a particular geographic region sure. that has a certain issue that's really causing them to vote for somebody? What I noticed is all the voting was very uh, straight across in mm -hmm. wards and districts. The, the percentages were very even. And But what I thought was interesting is that there were 1,400 votes not taken. So there are yeah. constituents out there that are selectively sure. voting. They're, sure. they're single bullet voters. And, you know, I got to change their mind. Yeah. Um, get to meet them. The higher the turnout in April 3rd will be better for both of you, don't you think? Oh, correct. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yes, very you know, much so. Well, you get 25% where it's not only a new game, but it's it's probably an even game. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. I have uh, one more. Sure, go ahead. Um, <laughs> this is kind of a take-home test, only it's, it's, it's we got to do it right now. We didn't take it home. We, we, we got, <laughs> this is not the, like the league. This, we got to do it so right now. So we come now. back? No, no, yeah, yeah. All right. We you know, call you tomorrow at home. I've been going through all of the issues, you know, things that you rate as the top issues. And it's interesting last night that the four challengers, not the two incumbents, listed accountability as really one of the main issues. Everyone kept saying accountability except for the two incumbents. And I think the second part of that is that you mean accountability in part, if not a large extent, to the city manager. So let's pretend that you two are on the, on the council, I'm Dick Wolnick, and Cheryl has snuck in to this secret <laughs> meeting because they have kept her out of secret meetings before. She's the fly on the wall. She got it. I don't know how she got in, but she got it. <laughs> so, you're, so you're going to write my job description or my goals for 2007, 2008 because you two are so high on accountability. What do you want Dick Wolnick to do in the next year? Give me, give me specifics. Not generals. What What do you want him to do? What do you want him to accomplish? Because you two are really big on accountability and making me more accountable as a city manager. What are you, What are you going to give me for job? Well, I'll tell you. I in my platform, I really talked a lot more about uh, setting an agenda as a councilwoman, okay. which okay. is quite a little bit different than accountability. I look at it as an issue of ownership. As a okay. council member, I believe I have responsibilities to carry out. How I feel, you know, one of the top things on my priority list with uh, Richard and goal setting has to do with accessibility to the city offices. Okay. Um, 
uh, it's a big issue. And looking at it from a business perspective, as far as the permit issuing and the inspection area of the city, that's a big part of what the city does. And one of the reality is, is if that's not streamlined, if that's not easy accessible, that costs developers money, that costs subcontractors money, that costs ultimately then the homeowner or, or the business owner money because if there's delays in the inspection and permitting process, that's a problem. And then if the inspectors say, oh, there's a deviation here you need to correct, well, then they need to be able to go back and fix that. So that's part of it. And then also looking at the office hours of City Hall. Um, the reality is, is the average household right now is a, is a two-income, you know, nine-to-five worker. And you know what? They, they, they can't get to City Hall mm -hmm. from, you know, eight-to-five or mm -hmm. nine-to-five. And how do we rectify that? I think it's great that they put the uh, credit card payment option on the, the city website. But I, I, I just don't think that's where it ends. I really think, and I understand that the union, um, you know, that the contracts indicate what the normal hours mm -hmm. are, but I really think that if you offered some of the folks that work in City Hall an opportunity to have a flexible schedule to come in later and stay later, I think some of them might take it because mm -hmm. they have children and they have people, they, you know, the caregiver issues, and I think there's people out there that say, you know what, I would like to work that different hour, or I would like to work Saturday morning instead of, a, you know, and get out earlier on a Wednesday when they have early release for the schools and to really say that's a benefit we can provide the constituents so my primary for because I recognize he's the day-to-day -day implementer of the agenda right. and I think that's the biggest you know issue as far as something that I can directly to point to him that he has control over there are some things that Richard doesn't have control over it. We can give him advice, you set something in motion and then either the state or the DNR or somebody else gets in the way of it but to me his direct relationship with the staff and employees yeah. is number I, one. I can handle that as city manager. That's not mm -hmm. too bad. He's got a whole list of things. Well, I'm, get, you know, I'm getting a little thank worried. You, you, you <laughs> allow me to write down a few Oh, he's, he's a good <laughs> You know, he did that right away. He went right to the pit. Richard, so, so give me some. One of the first things I want you to do is I want you to be the main spokesperson for the city. Okay. I want it basically the cheerleader. I want you the individual that when we want a business, business located here, when we want a retail business, whatever, you are the CEO. You need to get on the phone and call and say, this is the city manager. You don't think I'm doing that now? Do I think you're doing that yeah. now? No, I think it's left to other hands. Okay. okay. I need you to be leading the city hall. You are the main person. You need to be leading all the departments. You also need to make the city user friendly. And I like what Jeff said. Yeah, Very I, key I points. Yeah. And so, and My we're staff's going to get mad at me because we're going to have to give more hours. And you said we're right, doing this together. Not so more, that's just different. Just different. <laughs> Different. Not more. I'm not saying make options. Yeah, no, yeah. We want to bring you bring city government okay. to the 21st century. Yeah, I like it's that. been set up. It's way to it was back in the 18th, 19th centuries when government was okay. first set up. We need to bring you much more user friendly. Bring you to the 21st century okay. for the taxpayers who are the consumers, and those are the individuals that pay the bills that give us the money, and we need to do what's best for them. Okay. Can you do that, Richard? I can, I'm going to try real hard. <laughs> I didn't right. write it down, but I'm going to remember. It. All right. Yeah. We'll yeah. we'll see that your yeah. contract yeah. is well, renewed and then. The, you know, <laughs> and the other issues there is you. It, it, when we say, you know, when we give these demands to Richard, there also has to be an issue where they're time bound, mm -hmm. so we get a response mm -hmm. on what we're requesting. So I'll always be putting time limits on everything. Mm -hmm. I think we've learned that lesson historically, and that can't not be done. Mm -hmm. And and then I think you say they all have to be measurable, and saying you know either by a percentage or or I need to to see that you got response from employees about this issue or that issue, and you know they need to be results based. You know, change yeah, change yeah. is the key. You need to set that bar yeah. and say, Richard, this is what you need to to reach. If you don't reach it, there's ramifications. Mm -hmm. If you do reach it, there's rewards. That's where it is. <laughs> What's the reward, though? He keeps his job. He keeps his job. <laughs> there you go. Cool. Um, but beyond that, yeah. there are certain things that we don't have control of, and, and you hit on yeah, them with absolutely. the unions. And yeah. and you know, once you get involved in there, you find out there are some things you can't. But then, can we address it to where maybe a few years down the road sure. we can change it? It may take some time. It's mm -hmm. just how government works. Okay. Sounds good. Well, Thank merchants want to. Oh, no yeah, problem. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> merchants downtown want to see some accountability uh, in the way of seeing the downtown action plan put into action, mm -hmm. uh, some life and vibrancy restored down there. Um, you know, I think some of us have been harping about that for a long time, maybe others more than uh, some. But uh, what would both of you um, say to that, and how would we go about doing what the merchants want us to do mm -hmm. down there? Well, I think it's about 
making walking the walk and looking at our fi financial priorities. Um, I have to say that I'm just kind of educating myself right now as to what's really available with the capital improvement plan or you know how can you speed up the streetscapes and then what's really the role of the bid and to say you know how serious is 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 the bid with the, the extra things that it can do to to move that district along. Uh, the, um, one of the things though I have to say is when you go down there and talk to the business owners, whether it be Mike Russell or whether it be Kia or whether it be Eric Hoopman or whether it be Todd and Mark, I mean, you, you go down there and you, you talk to them about things and then you find out, wow, you know, the sewer pipes are rotting under those streets. Mm -hmm. They're 120 years old. And, what, and, and you listen to the insurance problems they have and the, you know, the reality that you have to sue, you, know, you have to sue City Hall to get some response and if you don't do that, they're not going to be accountable about it. And I, I guess the, fr you know, the first step is going down there and listening to what they really want because then the other issue is this, some of the um, business owners who are off the direct Main Street or they're not part of a TIF district and they see that angst of, you know what, I've been a small business owner here for 20 years and nobody's helping me and you know what, I'm struggling. Mm -hmm. and, and, then, and then the other thing, and somebody just said this to me at, um, at Hops and Props, they said, you know, Jess, nobody comes to ask us what we want. They, they put a plan in front of us and there's just definitely some of us that don't agree with it. So part of it is going down there and listening to them and the other part is looking at the downtown action plan and saying is streetscapes and the quality of that street is a huge issue. And then the parking issue, taking care of the parking issue. Uh, Jesse hit it in regards to the bid district. They want to be able to have input. Mm -hmm. um, there are some that feel as if they're left out of, of you know, they, we, when they first came up with that plan, we had town hall meetings, we got the input. But since then, since it's moved mm -hmm. along, there really hasn't been a chance for them to follow up and have input. Mm -hmm. Now. We have 2011 when they're going to come in and redo the uh, Highway 45, which is the, the state will do. Um, so part of that area is going to be funding by the state, and they're going to control it. But the other part, if you follow on down Main mm -hmm. Street, that primarily falls upon the owners of those buildings, the tenants who have their businesses in there. Mm -hmm. They're putting forth you know, the money, but they're having no additional input on what's going on from there and that gets back to you know you talked about the, the, the pipes we have to wait until we we right. do that because we don't want to dig up put in new pipes and come right. back and dig up again so and that is forced upon us not by us but the market interchange that everything got pushed back and all the projects so we have to live within those but we have some time it's 2007 2011 four years to get their input on how Main Street should be laid out and let's get everyone's input that's involved and has a, a stakehold there and also, you talk about the parking. They did a nice job behind the west side of the buildings. But now let's do something on the east side of the buildings. Because when we dig up Main Street, there's no parking. And that's going to go on the streets that are on the outside. So right now we have four years to redo that parking, get that all situated, so that it doesn't come 2011 and everything is screwed up. Okay. And then we're stuck with something, right. that, you know, right. with all the headaches. I, I kind of want to follow up on something that you said, Mark. You, you said that the, uh, you know, the members of the uh, business improvement district want to be asked what it is that they want and so forth. And I think that that's good. Uh, former city councilman Kevin McGee recently wrote an editorial in the Oshkosh Northwestern in which he said that city hall can get it right by just simply asking people what they would like and what they want. Um, I, I think most of us. At you know, we <laughs> are dealing with this election, certainly sitting at this table, think that City Hall should be asking questions more often of the public. Um, but what more should the city be doing and how should they go about it in, as far as asking people what they want? Go ahead. What, what I <laughs> thank oh you. Mind. Mark is so polite. <laughs> what, what, I, what I think is... Uh, incredibly valuable and I appreciate uh, council member Bain's effort in creating those fifth Tuesday forums and I, I think one of the one of the things I like about those is the fact that they are out in the community in various places and the other thing I like about it is it's at a time of day when people could actually come mm -hmm. right the the downside is the attendance of those things is usually right around the neighborhood of 10 to 18 to 5 people mm -hmm. so that's why I say well maybe that's not the answer you know maybe it has to do with beefing up our web page and you know getting the comment and finding other ways to get comments but the thing is I think it needs to be thematic and I think mm -hmm. it starts with a let's raise these issues and personally 
if, if I had my druthers, if I could have my way with this, I'd say as a council member during my council member statements, I'm really going to pick, pick an issue or pick a committee or pick an advisory board and talk about it in my council member statement and say, you know, this is what, you know, go out and talk to the mm -hmm. people that sit on there and say, what do you really think you need from the community? And then I'm going to talk about that on my Tuesday and use that time. I think it's a shame when when council member statements come up and people don't have anything to say. Mm -hmm. uh, to me that says you're not you're not being proactive. You you keep letting things come to you. Well, so if you have a lot to say. Well, if you do, <laughs> you're right. And then uh, but then the other part of it then is really saying, you know, instead of just having workshops that the Richard conducts is to say, you know, maybe maybe we should have something where it is having an association or having a stakeholder come in and say, "Hey, we want to give you some special time. We're willing to sit here as a body in our open meetings and have you tell us what you think about something." Okay. Okay, Mark? Main Street is our main thoroughway. It's extremely important. It involves everyone. I would suggest town hall meetings, postings on, on the website, mailings, putting in the paper. We have something that we're on right now, OCAT, which you could have an educational series put on on how it's going to affect the homeowners and the users in the community. So. We need to educate uh, the citizens on how it's going to affect them. And we need to make them aware. And it is, as just said, very hard to get people to turn out until it's the 11th hour, mm -hmm. and then they'll turn mm -hmm. out. Um, there are some issues, though, that it will get people involved, and they will get the passion behind it. And that's the point that getting them educated and getting uh, information out to them. The other, other thing I think would be really critical. Uh, here, here's something I think is interesting. There are a couple candidates right now that are proposing to create this entity or create this entity. More and, government. And mm -hmm. to be honest with you, I think that's an excuse because I think that's one more layer it's that you have to buck. hurdle mm -hmm. and then that's one more place where you can say, oh, well, that's their job, not my job. And I, so I don't like that. I, you know, I think, what, but what I do think we should do is add a process into the budgeting. Right now we've got uh, you know, we're doing the budget workshops earlier, and I think that's good for the council. But I think there needs to be an allocations process or a community feedback process because then we really know what people think about things. And I think it's not us making arbitrary cuts so suddenly the bookmobile's gone or, you know what I mean, an arbitrary cut like that. And I think it's important because what I appreciate about this community is they're willing to get up and talk about something when, when they feel they've been given the green light that, hey, we want your input. And nothing better to look at than the um, renovation at UW Fox Valley with their auditorium, right? I have never seen such a good letter to the editor writing campaign as they conducted and how active those people were. So I think if we put an allocations communication process and say, citizens, these are the items we're talking about today for budgeting. How would you prioritize and why are they important? Well, okay. And just I'm sorry. Oh. Real quick, real quick. I just said just the, the chancellor seconds. started very early on that, getting that information out. So once again, coming back to educating and getting the information out to the people, and that's why he did a very, you know, he got it passed the way he wanted to. Okay. He laid it out, he got the information, got everyone educated. Okay. And that's I how have you to do get it. the information Go out ahead. that we're out of time. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks to both of you for Thanks being here. Dan, thanks, thanks to you. Much, As always, yeah. thanks you. for yeah. joining yeah. us on this edition of Eye on Oshkosh. We'll see you next time. Yeah. Until then, take care. Keep your eye on us. We've got our eye on Oshkosh.